so without going into much detail, just in a broad sense, when this RAS molecule is bound to this other molecule called GTP, which is similar to what you may have heard, um, like in class, when you heard about ATP, which is the energy you get, um, like to go run or swim or jump over, you know, a hoop or something, um, that that's kind of very similar. It just has a different nucleotide. But in any event, all you need to know when it has two phosphates attached to it, it, it turns this RAS signaling off. Then don't worry about these horribly awful structures because you're probably like, oh my God, that's going to put me to bed. But what we need to know is that this thing called, there's like an exchange factor. And this factor exchanges that um, GDP for a GTP. So it goes from two phosphates to one phosphate. And the phosphate is just kind of a way to tell, the, to tell the cell, hey, I'm turning you on right now. And once that happens, that allows... RAS to be turned on so that light switch gets flipped on and then as that gets flipped on it creates all these effects and so what effects that happens is that it causes like the cells to um, proliferate to grow it tells them we're going to survive and so that's really like uh, you know fantastic if that's what you want to do. But you can, as you know, you can't always have a signal on. Like your mom and dad probably get mad at you because you leave the lights on, right? And so at some point your mom or dad will say, or whoever says you need to turn the lights off. So at some point you have to turn everything off. You can't have everything growing uncontrollably. And so there's these other proteins that come in and they kind of just take away one of those GTPs, or I'm sorry, one of those um, phosphates. And when it does take one of those phosphates off, it turns off the signal again. So we, it goes through these different motions of turning on the signal and then turning off the signal. And so what happens is that in cancer, um, you can get actual mutations in these RAS proteins. And when you get a mutation in these RAS proteins, um, that could cause, you know, that can be one of the leading causes of you developing some sort of cancer. And just to give you an idea, when this RAS gene is, um, does contain a mutation, it is responsible for over 30% of all cancers. And so it's a very big, um, very potent molecule that is um, affected in many different types of cancers. And so one way it can be affected is that you have here your original sequence. This is your DNA. And let's say this T decides, I don't like being a T anymore. I'm going to switch to this C. Okay, we just in short and short. And so when that happens, that causes this change in that gene and that causes it to be turned on all the time. So you get this mutation. It turns on this gene. It then tells the pathway you're going to be on. And when it turns it on like this, there's no, that that thing to turn it off can no, can no longer function. It can no, can, no, can no longer turn off this pathway. So you have these cells keeping are keeping growing and they're proliferating and they're growing and they're growing. And that's how you kind of get these tumors. You see like patients who have tumors throughout their bodies who have cancer and that was what kind of leads, to, part of the reason why it leads to cancer growth. And so if you drive race cars or know anything about race cars, um, I'm not a huge fan, but this is a great analogy. And how you can think about cancer is that RAS acts like um, like this, if, if you were driving a car that you're just pressing on the gas of that car really hard and you just have your foot on the gas the entire time. So you're just booking it down. You're going like a hundred miles per hour. So that's what happens when you get a mutation in this, in this gene. So that's one way you can develop cancer. Now, to, that's that's one way, but there's also another way that we can um, you know affect this pathway, and that way is by deactivating uh, the the molecule that turns off the pathway. And when you do that, that can happen either through like some kind of like you decide I don't like this T anymore, I'm going to remove it, I'm going to like you know take out a whole section of DNA. Either way, it makes what it happens is that when it does that to the DNA, it ends up making a protein that's not functional. So it can never function. So you can't have any kind of outcome. And so that no longer can allow this pathway to be turned off. So it kind of keeps this pathway, it keeps it going. So you kind of get the same result as you would if you got a mutation in the actual RAS gene by mutating or deleting or like stopping the function of this, of this gene that turns off the pathway, you get the same result where you see this increase in growth, survival, and then you get this uncontrollable cancer growth. Again, back to our race car analogy, what that kind of equates to is that you can still put the gas on, but now you have no brakes. It's like someone like cut your brakes. 
Okay, so you have the gas, but no brakes. So basically, these are two different mechanisms of how the, this kind of signaling can, you know, lead to uh, cancer. And so what I'm interested in is actually one of the gene, one of the proteins that turns off this pathway. And it's called neurofibromin. And it is this huge protein. And we're not going to go into to details about it, but it basically turns off this RAS signaling. And so you no longer, when you have this protein present in your body, and this is happening constantly as we are talking, it's turning on and off that um, pathway. So right now it might be in the off state, it, you know, or it can be on the on state, but it eventually will turn it off. Um, so what I'm interested in is that a lot of times in the many different types of cancers, that protein is either deleted or lost. So you can no longer um, have a functioning protein. And when you no longer have this neurofibromin functioning properly, this again, like as we said before, leaves this pathway on and RAS can keep going. So it's like you keep telling the computer game, I'm going to keep hitting punch, 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 punch. And that's kind of the same way that this pathway is going. It's just going, going, going. And so these cells keep proliferating, they keep growing and they keep growing and growing and that triggers this cancer growth. And so when you have this, when uh, patients have loss of this gene called neurofibromin, it actually accounts for quite a bit, uh, quite a bit different percentages um, in many different types of cancers, melanoma being one of them. Melanoma is a skin cancer. Um, you probably may, may or may not know about it, but that um, usually starts off with moles on your skin that you've gotten from either sun sunbathing or UV light. And that, um, if you, that can cause loss of function of this one protein. Um, it's also prevalent in a lot in lung cancer, leukemia, uh, glioblastoma is a um, brain cancer, um, and then also in um, breast cancer as well as ovarian cancer. So the loss of this gene is very, very prevalent in cancer. Um, but the unfortunate thing about this gene is that nobody knows what is going on. We only know this one function of this gene. Um, this, it, not this gene wasn't found very too far long ago, but what was re more of a recent finding was that this gene was actually lost in a lot of cancers. And because technology took a little bit of time to catch up, we didn't even know that this gene was lost in these cancers until about maybe five years ago. And so this is actually really, really recent that we found that this is an actual important contributor that drives cancers. And so what my main focus is, is that I know that you know, neurofibromin works to shut off RAS signaling. So I wanted to determine, well, does this protein have any kind of alternative functioning uh, functions other than just regulating this pathway? And so to do that, what I did is I set up the system. So here we have some mouse cells. They're just mouse skin cells. And um, what I did, and you don't even worry about this freakishly long name and horribly sounding, um, name of this um, technique, but you may have heard of a thing called CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9. And what CRISPR-Cas9 does um, is basically it finds a segment in the DNA. And what it does with the DNA is that it recognizes something. And once it recognizes some sort of sequence in the DNA, what happens is, is it makes cuts in the DNA. So you have a two double-stranded size of your DNA, so it makes a cut through both of them. And then when it cuts through the DNA, as you can see here, you miss a piece of DNA, right? And so your cell hates that, okay? Your cell says, I do not like not having any DNA. So it either goes back and it will repair your DNA. And this continuously happens in your body as we speak. But when it does that, it would, it, in this kind of scenario, what it does, it either can insert um, a new piece of DNA or it can just like kind of put the two pieces back together. And so when it does that, it alters the function of a gene. And so in this case, I use this technique to eliminate or get rid of the neurofibromin in these cells. And that's how I plan on studying um, what the functions of, you know, what the functions of neurofibromin do. And so this is just the way to get rid of the cell or get rid of the gene and able to really just understand what is going on. And this is a technique that's being currently used. It's um, 
kind of made an appearance within the last uh, several years and it's been very popular. And you may have heard about it already because they've been trying to use it as treatments also I think for uh, many, some, some different types of cancers. So lastly, I just wanted to show to you um, so I had a high school student, she was from Wallenberg High School, and she helped me on this project. So as I go back and tell you, um, you know, there are opportunities for you to do, you know, really exciting things. And you should always be open to the opportunity because this one student was, and she came to my lab for the summer and she got to help me a little bit on this project. And I know this is what her data she, she found. And basically she found in the cells where I got rid of the, and, um, the neurofibromin and she was just looking to see how does that affect the cells and how do they proliferate or how do they grow? And what she found was basically when we eliminated the neurofibromin gene, there was really no difference in growth compared to their, their uh, original cells. So that was really like an interesting result. And it was so interesting that her, this results that she found will actually be in a publication in the next year. Um, and so she gets to be a co-author on, on this paper. And so I just wanted to let you know that, that you can do, you can make contributions, even though you might not think at the time that they're very significant. This actually is a very significant finding and that that can help her you know, later on in any future uh, career that she may have. If, whether she stays in science or not, it doesn't matter. That's just you know, evidence that she's able to, you know, to work hard and you know, from her work and being you know, diligent, she was able to um, get a positive result.